uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Jingjing Kip. I'm an associate professor from the uh, Department of Biological Sciences, and I serve as a chair of uh, uh, William D. Uh, William D. Gutis Women in Science and Health Lecture uh, Committee. I'm so excited to see everyone here for our second annual event. Uh, as many of you know, we launched this lecture series last year, and the last year's event was completely online. <laughs> that was the only option we had. Uh, I'm so happy to see that this time we can actually have a lot of audience here sitting in this room, and, uh, and we also have even more audience online. So this is a very well-attended event. We are very excited to have our keynote speaker here um, and really look forward to the exciting talk. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I want to remind the online participants that you may submit your questions by the chat function, or you may raise your hands and uh, we will unmute you and then, uh, give you a chance to ask questions. For the in-person attendees here, of course, you, you're welcome to ask questions anytime and uh, directly we can see you here. And this pre uh, presentation is being recorded and the recording will be posted um, uh, CSH's uh, YouTube channel uh, when it's ready. So today uh, we will begin by uh, welcoming remarks from Dr. Daniela Stan Recul, the past associate provost for research. Uh, Dr. Stan Recul is a professor of a school of uh, computing uh, from the College of Computing and Digital Media. Uh, also known as a CDM. I'm sure people here all heard of CDM. Uh, so now I will just turn over the podium to Dr. Stan Regu. Good afternoon, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the 2022 William Degatis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series, an opportunity to promote the accomplishments of women as well as an opportunity to create community and scholarship among faculty, staff, and students interested in the sciences, mathematics, and health sciences. Celebrating the successes of women who are role models is the catalyst for the next generation, for the next generation scientists to envision the future. Women representation is crucial for the success of the scientific endeavor and our efforts to improve medicine, health, and social justice. As the late Rat uh, Bader uh, Ginsburg stated, women belong in all places where decisions are made. More needs to be done at the local, regional, and national level to increase women representation. The National, uh, national Institutes of Health interest in diversity notice in November 2019 reflects a formal category recognizing women as an underrepresented population in the US biomedical, clinical, behavioral, and social sciences research enterprise. At the local level, academic institutions play a significant role in encouraging, supporting, and promoting women in science and health. Today's event is a key testimony that here at DePaul, we are playing a significant role in this effort. This year's lectures builds on the success of the inaugural lecture of the William Degatis Women in Science and Health 2021 lecture that featured on the origins of gender, brain sex differences, neuroplasticity, and women's advancement in STEM by Dr. Liz Elliott, Professor of Neuroscience, Rosalind Franklin University. This year, we have the honor to have Dr. Vicky Caloguera, Distinguished Professor of Northwestern University, present Einstein's Waves, Cosmic Sounds from Black Holes and ne uh, Neutron Stars. This lecture series was made possible through a generous donation from Hippol alumni, Dr. Linda Tigadis, and you are going to hear more about her in a little bit. And I'd like to thank personally to Linda for being a role model, okay? For us, for all of us in the community and for her generosity. 
I would also like to thank Jing Jing and the planning committee for organizing the event and for their dedication to make this event a continuous source of energy and inspiration for all of us. Thank you. In my concluding remarks, I wanted to say that there is always more to learn. And the fact that you are here, both in person and online, it means that you agree with me, right? There is always more to learn. As a scientist myself, one of the best parts of my job is getting to follow my curiosity and inspiring my students to always find ways to contribute themselves to science. Together, we can make a difference for the many generations to come. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Stan Ku, for the wonderful remarks. Uh, it's very inspiring. And uh, next, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Dansbars, Dean of the College of Science and Health at DePaul University, will give us an introduction to this lecture series and also introduce Dr. Linda DeGutis, uh, as we know, the sponsor of this program. Uh, Dr. Dan Barnes is an expert in cancer biology research and also in STEM education. She has been serving as a Dean of a CSH since uh, 2020. So Dean Dan Barnes. I too would like to start by, by thanking Jing Jing and the planning committee for this wonderful event. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everyone. As she indicated, I'm Stephanie Dance Barnes, and I'm Dean of the College of Science and Health. And I do want to also thank Daniela for your remarks today. And um, uh, I just want to say once again, welcome to everyone else for being here because. Um, I, I think this just speaks to us now uh, getting over a hump, I feel, because last year this was not the case. <laughs> but um, once again, Daniela, thank you. And consistent with the university's mission, you and your role as associate provost of re for research and also your office of research services, your efforts continue to help us um, promote, facilitate, and support research, scholarship, teaching, and creative activities that are uh, conducted here at DePaul. And so um, because of you, a lot of this has been made possible. So thank you for your efforts. Um, it is such a tremendous honor to once again welcome all of you in person today to the second installment of the William J. Gudis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. And this is an annual event that's sponsored by our college. And I want to make sure that I also acknowledge those that are joining us remotely. I, was, I think I was saying before, even though COVID has been pretty sucky, this, this, is really, this really speaks to a benefit. We can have so much, many more people here. <laughs> um, so once again, one positive aspect that we have derived from these last almost two years, believe it or not, of dealing with COVID, is that we now know we can engage with one another in a more flexible um, set of modalities, being able to meet physically in person while also simultaneously connecting with those remotely from wherever they might be. And our faculty and staff through innovative instruction and other modes of academic support have done a tremendous job in ensuring that our students also have the best learning experience possible despite very challenging and to be quite honest, stressful circumstances. And so I, I think we can't uh, forget um, the, the challenges that we've all been under, particularly our students. And so being here today and having them with us um, is tremendous. I believe we all have come on the other side of this being adaptable. And to, once again, being quite honest, recognizing the importance of giving each other grace when circumstances may not go as according to plan. The college has a rich history of supporting women in science through lecture series stemming back to 2005 um, and the establishment of the GM LeDuke Women in Mathematics, Science and Technology and um, annual lecture series hosted by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences was really the, the start and foundation for this. The purpose of the LeDuc lecture series was to honor the contributions of Dr. G. Ann LeDuc, 
who was the Associate Professor Emeritus of the Department of Mathematical Sciences, who taught for over 30 years at DePaul and who conducted groundbreaking research on the contributions of early 20th century women in mathematics in the United States. From 2005 to 2016, this series invited prominent scientists to share their expertise with the DePaul community. Jeanne LeDuc graciously granted her permission for the renaming of this valuable series to what is now the William J. DeGutis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. And we are so very grateful, Jean, for her many contributions. The purpose of the DeGutis Lecture Series is to promote the accomplishments of women in the natural and health sciences, as well as other closely related fields. This series provides us the unique opportunity to create scholarship and community among faculty, staff, students, and the public, while reinforcing the importance of creating an equitable and inclusive environment in which women can be supported and acknowledged for the invaluable innovations, ideas, and alternate pr perspectives that we bring to the table. Reflecting back on the college's 10th anniversary this, this past year, believe it or not, there was one event among many that really stood out to me. It was the Women in Science and Health creating a legacy panel discussion. This panel was com comprised of female faculty and staff from across the college. These very accomplished members of the panel eloquently share their diverse perspectives, inspirations, experiences, insights, and advice as professionals who have navigated and perhaps overcome challenges in their journey to achieve positive outcomes in science and health. I recall one of the most impactful questions raised during the discussion was what each of the panelists felt they wanted their legacy to be. That topic of creating legacy is just just really stood out in my mind as I have been thinking about um, as I prepared for this event today and how I approach my own personal and professional life. I have been so fortunate to meet and get to know Dr. Linda DeGudis, a wonderful and dynamic member of our CSH Advisory Council. During various conversations with Linda, who I've had the pleasure of introducing today, it was clear to me what she believed her father's legacy to be. Her father being William J. DeGudis, a World War II veteran that worked at Ford Motor Company and for the U.S. Department of Interior Federal Water Pollution Control Administration for many years protecting waterways. He instilled in his daughter, Linda, a love and a passion for science and public service. And it is that passion and love for science and service that brought us here today. Linda, like her father, wants to ensure that the long-standing issue of the lack of representation of women in STEM is addressed by creating a sustained platform that encourages participation and highlights the successful research and service and achievements of women in STEM careers. And fortunate for us, this opportunity has come in the form of this impactful series. It must be noted that Linda is a very accomplished woman in STEM herself. Linda is a proud DePaul alum and nationally recognized leader for her policy, advocacy, and work on initiatives focusing on prevention of violence and injury, in addition to suicide prevention and intervention. Currently, she shares the board of the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, and she is the immediate past president of the Society for the Advancement of Violence and Injury. Linda is an outstanding example of the caliber of graduate that CSH produces. Our graduates have the distinction of ascension character, where they, where they are uniquely equipped to engage, innovate, and make discoveries in science and health to serve or be in service to others. This is because our graduates have learned to ask the hard questions, empathize with people whose experience and perspectives may be different from their own, to test ideas with science and rigor, and trust that diverse minds working together have the ability to arrive at more creative solutions. This speaks to our amazingly talented students and alumni that are making a tremendous difference in the world we live in. This speaks to the many contribution, contributions of dynamic women in science 
that represent the College of Science and Health. This also speaks to the necessity to continue to support meaningful efforts such as this. Once again, I want to emphasize the importance of why we are all here today, to acknowledge the legacy of William J. DeGudis and the sustained impact that he's had on Linda and through the reach of this lecture series, ultimately his impact on many other women in science as well. At this time, please join me on behalf of the college in thanking Dr. Linda DeGudis for a gift that supports this lecture series. And I now turn the stage over to her for remarks. Thank you, Dean Barnes. And we couldn't do a hug last year either. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I mean, it's 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 amazing. Um, it's so great to see all of you here and everybody who's online on Zoom. Um, and I think um, it's it's just it's just really a tribute to all of the women in science who are leaders at DePaul as well, and in leadership positions. I'd like to thank the committee for the work that they've done on all of this, but I think um, you're seeing right now that DePaul is supporting women um, very strongly and really a lot of women scientists are in great positions here. Um, just to tell you a little bit about why, why I did this. Um, my dad was, he did not have a college degree. Um, he was a World War II vet. He was in the Army Air Corps um, and um, he had various jobs until he went to work for what was the Department of Health, Education and Welfare. And then it became the Department of the Interior and was the Federal Water Pollution Control Administration. And then it became the EPA. Um, so he actually was one of the early EPA employees and he worked there until he died um, at the age of 51 when I was a junior at, at DePaul. But one of the things that he always instilled was the importance of an education. And I think the other thing he always said was, he, he never said girls can't do things. It was always like, you can do whatever you wanna do, you know? To the point that um, in order to get my driver's license, I had to prove I could change the tire, I could check the oil, I could check the radiator fluid, you know, all those kinds of things. But that's how he was, you know? You, you, you can do all these things. It doesn't mean because you're a girl, you can't do it. Um, but I benefited a lot from his work at the EPA because he did field work and he was often out on a boat doing sampling and uh, with some of the other staff from the EPA and he did a lot of traveling around the Midwest. But um, he also used to bring me to the lab and I used to be able to go to the lab and see what they were doing. And there were women working in the lab, at a number of women who worked there and they would always explain what they were doing and they would always talk about um, what, you know, what their experiments were and how they were trying to do different things and test things out to decrease the amount of pollution and um, the pollution, a lot of it in Lake Michigan at the time. Um, so, and then he used to bring me home um, specimens sometimes. <laughs> like I had a lamprey eel that was in the basement, you know, on the, on the shelf in a little jar. Um, it, it didn't come home live. It was dead when it came home. Um, otherwise, probably a, <laughs> my mother would have thrown it up. <laughs> but, um, but he was the one who always encouraged that. He encouraged experimentation. Um, he, one time I wanted to do a science experiment to see how algae grew. So he brought home algae and gave me ways of testing it and testing the oxygen in the water. And I, this is when I was in elementary school, you know. Um, he didn't think it was weird that I wanted a chemistry set when I was eight years old. Um, so, so he really encouraged all of that and encourage an education. And one of the things that I always um, remembered was I have a cousin who's about seven years older than me. And she went, she's a nurse and she got her master's degree in nursing. And when she got her master's degree, he said, you know, he said, I'm really, I'm really proud of Nita. And he said, and I wouldn't be surprised if she went on to get her doctorate. You know, so it was like this whole thing about how education was just so, so important. And I think that's, Part of the reason that I did this, that he was the one who encouraged me. I've been able to do so much because of what he did and his encouragement. Uh, I'm sorry he's not here um, to be here. He would think 
what what is this why is the lecture honoring me but um you know but that's okay um you know i think it's i think it's a great way to remember him and remember his influence and hopefully it will influence other women and really encourage people to uh, women to go into science and take science as a career path and look at it as a serious way to do some good and really help make the world a better place. So thank you all. And I am looking forward to, to hearing the lecture from Dr. Caligara. I think it'll be great. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Degutis. Uh, it was wonderful to hear about your father and your upbringing in Chicago. Uh, it's a really inspirational to all of us. Uh, as uh, Dr. Gensmar mentioned earlier, one of the purposes of uh, this lecture series is to uh, promote the accomplishments of women in natural science and uh, in health. And we will hear more about the accomplishments of today's keynote uh, shortly. Dr. Kastash is an associate professor of physics and astrophysics. Here's uh, Dr. Kastash. So I get to do the easy thing, which is like stop talking and let the person we're all here to <laughs> talk. So um, Dr. Caligara is coming to us, uh, as a couple of people mentioned, as a distinguished professor uh, from uh, University of, uh, Northwestern University. Um, she is also the co-founder of Sierra, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and, and Research in Astrophysics. This is um, a really predominant center, um, and many of our astrophysics students here at DePaul have done internships there um, and been very successful. Uh, she did her bachelor's degree in Greece and then actually did her PhD at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, um, after which she was a postdoc at the Smithsonian uh, Astrophysical Observatory. She has received numerous awards. I'm not going to try to list them all. Several of them are listed in the program and has also been um, a, a, a member of several national committees. She is a leading astrophysicist in the LIGO uh, collaboration. So LIGO is the uh, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, we're actually going to hear quite a bit about that today. Um, as since I, I can't help it, a little bit of a personal note, I, I don't. I, I am, I am a physicist, but I am not an astrophysicist. Um, but the most exciting scientific discovery in my lifetime, I think, was the, the discovery that happened with LIGO. I got more excited about that than I have about anything else science in my life. Um, so I'm actually very excited to hear about this. Um, she is an expert in the astrophysics of compact objects, black holes, um, and neutron stars, the death of the death remnants of stars, which I always love that phrase. It sounds very dramatic. Um, <laughs> uh, and particularly studying their formation and evolution, particularly in systems with multiple stars. But I'm very excited, and I hope you all will join me in welcoming Dr. Caligat. Wow, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I was actually quite excited to come down because, as you heard, we have uh, interactions with the Paul. Uh, I've known your students before I've known some of you as faculty. Um, and it's, uh, it was a great opportunity when I received the invitation. Uh, I think I responded maybe within, uh, I don't know, I know it was the same day. Um, and um, and I, I, it's, it's great to be able to be here in person. And I didn't know I was going to be the first in person in this uh, series, so that's even more special. Uh, thank you to the audience on Zoom. Uh, and yes, it's great to be able to do these hybrid events uh, so that we can give the opportunity to uh, everybody who uh, cannot come in person to be on Zoom. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, from uh, anyone and at any time during the talk. Um, Linda, of course, thank you for making this possible. I'm sorry I'm addressing you with your first name. Uh, I, I suspect we'll talk more about the, um, uh, after the lecture, uh, but I wanted to say you almost brought me to tears because um, my father actually was my uh, uh, beacon in life um, and he never went to college. Um, and a lot of who I am, uh, 
Uh, and what I did is all because of him, even though he had no idea uh, why. Uh, so, and, um, so I won't say anything more now, uh, but um, uh, I want to thank you all for being here and I guess we should get started. And what I was supposed to be doing while talking was actually putting some codes on my laptop and connecting my laptop, but I, didn't get to do this, so I'm gonna try and do this very quickly. So, um, so yes, it's a, a pleasure to talk about this uh, work that I had the fortune to be involved in. Uh, you know, nobody um, uh, decides to pursue, uh, there's many of you who went through graduate school and uh, pursued PhD studies, none of us goes into graduate school thinking they're going to be involved uh, into something that becomes, uh, you know, shake science and engineering uh, in this way. Um, and I feel very, very fortunate uh, that I happen to uh, overlap in space and time <laughs> with this, because uh, it has been a, quite an amazing uh, experience, and I'm happy to share some of this with you today. Uh, so I will tell you about um, the discovery of gravitational waves, the direct detection of gravitational waves for the first uh, time in 2015. And this is it. This is this is the big thing. This little scribble that looks like <laughs> trash um, uh, is what shook the world. Um, and then uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what followed. First of all, how it was made, I'll, I'll try and cover a lot, the work of a lot of people over many, many decades. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll tell you about where we are right now. So, but let's get started with some basics, okay? So gravitational waves um, are produced uh, by anything that has a mass. Right now I'm producing gravitational waves, but we're not gonna talk about my arms during the lecture. Uh, instead, we're gonna talk about black holes and neutron stars. And the reason is that compact objects like black holes and neutron stars produce the strongest possible gravitational waves. And these waves overall in the universe are very, very weak. We'll get to that. And we need this to focus on the strongest possible waves because they are overall so weak. And if we had any, any chance of catching them, we had to focus on the strongest sources. So I'm going to start by um, uh, making sure everybody's on the same page about black holes and neutron stars. So as it was mentioned already, they're basically corpses, okay? They're the mm -hmm. death remnants of stars. Uh, stars um, uh, mimic human experiences, experience in many ways. They are born, uh, people study how stars are born. They evolve. I spent a lot of my time before LIGO studying how stars live. And then uh, we also study how they die. Uh, our sun, will eventually die uh, four and a half billion years from now, roughly, give or take. Um, and it's gonna not become a black hole or an interest. It's gonna become something called white dwarf, and I'm not gonna talk about this. But more massive stars uh, will go through its, um, through its life, and it's gonna uh, um, go through a giant phase, potentially go through a supernova, although not all massive stars do that. And some of them will form neutron stars. Uh, these are, and I'm, I'm gonna give you another uh, description of that in a minute, and others become black holes. And black holes are the objects where gravity basically has won the war. Okay, so the matter has collapsed completely to the point where the, the object is so condensed that there is an imaginary surface. Yes, astrophysicists may not have imaginary friends, but we have imaginary <laughs> surfaces. Um, and we talk about them as if they're real surfaces. Um, and from that surface, if you get to cross it, then you have no escape. You, you would need an escape velocity higher than the speed of light to actually escape the black hole. And of course, we cannot reach physically an escape velocity uh, bigger than the speed of light. Now, did we know that black holes existed before gravitational waves? The answer is yes. So I'd like to make that clear. We had strong evidence 
for the existence of gravitational waves through X-ray sources and electromagnetic, regular astronomy, as I call it, uh, because black holes, when they are found in pairs with regular stars, they kind of tend to consume their companions. So not great neighbors. Uh, they're so strong in their gravity that they actually pull gas from the regular, like the sun could be next to a black hole like this. And then matter from the sun would flow onto the black hole, create havoc, um, including jets and a bright accretion disk. And we would observe a black hole indirectly as an X-ray source. And through the analysis of these X-ray sources, we have had since the discovery happened in the late 60s, but we got convinced and we is the royal we of the astrophysics community uh, that black holes exist through the study of X-ray binaries. Um, so then the next question I would like to address is what are neutron stars? Okay, so that we all come on the same page. Well, neutron stars are not as compact as black holes, but they're almost as compact. So matter manages to avoid complete win of gravity in the collapse of the star, as the star has lost its ability to support its own self against its own gravity, it becomes very, very compact and matter manages to find a way to support the extreme gravity if it doesn't have a very high mass and you form a neutron star, what's that? It's basically a ball of neutrons. So that it's so compact that everything has dissolved and you have bulk neutrons as being the composition of that object. Uh, but now you are able with that uh, ball of neutrons to actually resist gravity and create an object in equilibrium. But this object cannot be very massive. So it can only be, for us, it's only <laughs> one and a half times the mass of the sun. But now think of the mass of the sun um, and put it in a volume with a diameter, a spherical volume with a diameter that's just about 20 miles across. That's a metropolitan downtown, okay? So to scale, here's an image of our beloved Chicago skyline. And to scale, this is actually the surface, not imaginary, hard surface of a neutron star hanging over our city if a neutron star were that close, okay? It wouldn't be that big, but it would be one and a half times the mass of our sun. Uh, thankfully, we don't have a neutron star hanging over our city, <laughs> but we made this uh, image when, um, when a neutron star collision was discovered uh, in gravitational waves. And this image made it on the cover of the science section of the New York Times to announce that discovery. And I always love to show this because of course the Chicago skyline made it in the New York Times. So <laughs> I always tease the science writer that he had to use it. Um, now, did we know that neutron star existed before the discovery in gravitational waves? The answer is yes. In fact, they were discovered back, back in 1967 by a female graduate student, um, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, which I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, some years back and hosting um, at Northwestern. You may want to invite her one day. Um, she, uh, basically, I won't tell the story of the discovery, not enough time, but she discovered them in radio astronomy. So it turns out neutron stars are not quiet. They manage through this compact surface to actually create radio emission beams. Why? It's not the evening to explain that, the afternoon, but they have very bright radio beams and they also rotate. Um, and the rotation axis is misaligned from the radio beams and they act like lighthouses, except now the lighthouse that crosses our radio telescopes is in radio instead of an optical lighthouse. And that's how Jocelyn found, accidentally found this in her data, but then she realized that these radio lighthouses are very regular, periodic. And even though she was looking for something else, she realized that 
this is something really important. Um, eventually, she won many other prizes, but she was never um, given the opportunity to share, at least in the Nobel Prize. But eventually, she won the Breakthrough Prize, which is really the biggest prize um, in physical sciences at present. So, black holes. We were certain they exist in nature. Neutron stars, we were certain they exist in nature through electromagnetic astronomy. And electromagnetic astronomy is basically what we've had for 400 years, uh, modern electromagnetic astronomy. We had electromagnetic astronomy even before because basically ancient cultures have studied the skies with the first telescope, which is our own eye and our own eyes sensitive to electromagnetic waves, the optical light. So uh, astronomy over centuries has, uh, has uh, developed as a field in terms of understanding our universe based on the detection of electromagnetic waves. And at first it was really limited to the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but in the previous century, throughout the century, the advancement in technology often pushed because of astronomy uh, has allowed us to actually realize that we can detect sources and we can discover the universe in radio, x-rays, microwaves, um, gamma rays, infrared, uh, and then that technology has found all kinds of applications from medical to um, security, to defense, to kitchens, um, to TV, remote controls, etc. Uh, throughout our lives. Okay, back to gravitational waves now. So, in 2015, on September 14, what we discovered with a new type of telescope was the first gravitational wave. And we were able to detect it and analyze it and convince ourselves that this is an actual new way of studying the universe. Now, it's very simple to state it the way I said it, uh, but uh, it was this was the, the culmination of the work of, uh, by that time, it was a thousand people. Um, it was effort of over 40 years. Um, and of course, this was the prediction made that gravitational waves exist made by Einstein a century before that. 1915, he developed the theory of general relativity, which I will teach you about today. And, um, and he made the prediction that gravitational waves must exist in nature in 1916. Okay. So what did, what, oh yeah, this is not a video. Uh, so what did we observe? Well, we observed two black holes, one going around the other, disturbing space time and producing gravitational waves. I'll give you more of an intuition on that in a few minutes. The importance of this was not just the discovery. In many areas of physics, we often, the discovery of something is the end of the journey, okay? This was the beginning of a new era. People like me, the astrophysicists in the community wanted to, go past this discovery to do astrophysics with gravitational waves. Now, you cannot do astrophysics with one object, okay? Imagine trying to understand all stars by only studying the sun. You're not gonna learn that much about stars or galaxies and cosmology and the beginning of the universe by only studying our own galaxy. Very twisted biased understanding of the universe. So one discovery, as exciting as it was, as much as it changed our lives as scientists, us in the collaboration, uh, it, was, it was just the beginning. So I'm more excited about where we are now, even though we're not making the front covers of uh, newspapers. Now, um, let me spend a few minutes telling you what are gravitational waves, okay? So I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of intuition. And to do that, I'll try to first explain to you 
the core concept of general relativity. Okay, and I'll try and do this in a couple of slides. General relativity is a new theory describing gravity that Einstein put forward over a century ago. So I'll, I'll try to explain general relativity in contrast to regular gravity. Gravity is one and only in nature, but in terms of Newtonian gravity. So Newton's gravity uh, or understanding of gravity or description of gravity was the following, that it's a force that affects masses, that two masses, if they are at any distance from one another, here the masses are blue and yellow, and this has um, this has nothing to do with Ukraine, but it's uh, I've had this slide that was made by one of my graduate students before the discovery, actually, when we were talking about what we will do with LIGO. Um, so Newton's understanding was that if you have two masses in space time, but for our purposes, we're going to think of only space and we're going to think of space primarily as a plane, as a two-dimensional plane, uh, they are affected by gravity. And it's an attractive force. If two objects are at some distance, then there is a certain force that wants to bring them together. And it connects the two centers of the masses, okay? And that if, if you give a kick to one of the masses, the lighter mass, this force will basically keep it in a circular motion one around the other. Space around it is undisturbed, doesn't know anything about gravity, doesn't get affected by the mass. Everything is rather simple. Somehow there is this imaginary so a force there they, uh, that we don't know how it actually gets created, but it has a certain magnitude. We can do calculations with it. And, and a lot of physics was understood with this theory. Einstein uh, came. So the important thing is that masses move, but space and time are fixed. The important difference with general relativity, and that's the one I will focus on, is that in Einstein's thinking, the core conceptual difference is that mass affects space. And the way mass affects space is by creating curvature. So if I now take the same uh, two masses and I place them in space, then my, and, and time, but I'm gonna stick to space, then my space is not gonna be unaffected. My undisturbed space is gonna feel the heaviness of the mass. And that this curvature itself is the nature of gravity. And that if now I have my space geometry being curved, if I kick one of the balls, then the balls have to move in this curved space time. So they're gonna move into this circular way the way water flows, I'm sorry for the image, in a toilet sink. <laughs> um, so let's see if I can play this. Oh, it played. So this is the dimples. And now, if I kick it, then the ball just follows the geometry. So the concept is that uh, uh, mass affects space and the space geometry change tells the mass how to move. There is no, we can't explain how it exists, force that connects the two. It's the curvature of the space that produces the force, okay? Now, if I have these dimples in the, in the space and the masses are moving and accelerating, then the dimples are propagating and they're creating disturbances. And one can show that actually you're generating waves. These disturbances are not static. They cannot stay local there. They, the equation show that if you're gonna create the disturbance and you're gonna accelerate your masses, then you produce waves. The same way that the charged particle that is being accelerated is producing electromagnetic waves and those waves have to propagate away from the source. 
So that is what gravitational waves are. They are basically traveling space time disturbances away from masses that are being accelerated, okay? So my arms are moving, they're being accelerated, I'm producing gravitational waves. The problem is that my masses are of low mass and I'm not moving with the speed of light. My arms are not moving with the speed of light. So my gravitational waves are even more minuscule than what black holes produce. Now, the waves are carrying energy, and um, I went back. The waves are carrying energy, and it turns out that as these two objects, masses are going one around the other, they're losing energy from their motion because the waves are leaving and they're taking energy from this motion. Now, if I have two things that are going one around the other, but let's say, there is friction somehow, and I'm losing my energy, then what happens? I'm spiraling in. So eventually I'm gonna collide. The two objects will merge. Well, this is what we're observing. The black holes are going one around the other. They're emitting gravitational waves. We are detecting them, but they're losing energy. And eventually they merge. And if they merge, they form one black hole. It stays, I'm doing it with hands, you'll see it in fancy video in a minute. And then it settles, they form one black hole and there's no motion anymore. And if there is no motion, there is no waves. And that's it. There's no more emission of gravitational waves. That's why our sources are not continuous. They come, we detect them, they end, okay? All right. So this is really the punchline from uh, general relativity that is important for the generation of gravitational waves. Now, before the detection, did we know gravitational waves existed? The answer is yes, okay? So the, the big achievement is not that for the first time we showed the world gravitational waves exist, but it's for the first time we're able to detect them and create a new way to study sources that only emit gravitational waves. Just like we can, at some point, we were able to detect gamma ray sources for the first time and discover objects that we could not discover in the optical. So now we're expanding our study of the universe with a new tool. How did we know that gravitational waves existed? Well, soon after the discovery of the first radio pulsar, in 1974, uh, Joe Taylor and his student, Russell Hals, <clears throat> um, they were trying to find more pulsars. They found a pulsar and they studied it for a few months and they realized through the signal, I won't tell you how, they realized that actually there's clear evidence that that pulsar is not alone. It has a companion and it's moving in an orbit. And they started studying the orbit. Two neutron stars now, Pulsar, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember if I did use this, but it's the lighthouse. It's the neutron star lighthouse. It's called a Pulsar. It has a an, an companion. They're going in an orbit. Now, what do you have? Two compact objects, one going around the other. Guess what? They're emitting gravitational waves, but we're studying them in radio waves. So you can detect the gravitational waves, but with the radio waves of the lighthouse, you can tell that the orbit is changing. And the key thing is that after five years, they made the first measurement of how fast is the orbit shrinking. And they showed quantitatively down to a very small error bar that the orbit is shrinking at the right rate consistent with the hypothetical emission of gravitational waves if Einstein is correct. And that prediction and measurement kept went hand in hand for decades. And it was the strongest evidence that gravitational waves are a real thing, which of course drove another community to really try and build a gravitational wave detector. So how do you detect gravitational waves? Okay, so if you want to detect anything, the first question to ask is, 
what does it do to my environment? Okay. If I cannot understand from theory, from experiment, what does this thing that I'm trying to detect might do to my environment? You have no way of detecting. So first we're gonna answer the question, what do gravitational waves do if they are traveling? I told you how they're generated, but what do they do if they go through this room? So what is their effect? <clears throat> well, this is what they do. Why they do this, it's a, it's a little, I would need more slides. So I'll just tell you what they do. If we had a gravitational wave that goes, propagates along a line perpendicular to the board uh, where you see the slides, then the space, the two-dimensional space of the board would be affected the way shown by these squeezed and stretched circles. If there is no gravitational waves, the circles would not be moving. They would be perfect circles on the board. The gravitational wave that comes perpendicular to the board creates this kind of disturbance, takes space and makes it squeezed and stretched and squeezed and stretched in two dimensions, one in one polarization, we say, and another in an expo polarization, 45 degrees. So people realize that's what we want to figure out how to measure. If I can measure this, then I can detect the gravitational wave. It's not that simple because this stretching and squeezing, even for a gravitational wave that comes from very um, fast moving black holes, is tiny. It, you can't see it by eye. So I'll tell you now how tiny it is soon at least. So it was a huge challenge. Oh, I'm telling you now. If you took the whole Earth and a gravitational wave, a significant gravitational wave, the kind that we now measure, goes through it, the whole Earth would be stretched and squeezed and stretched and squeezed by the size of a proton. How do you measure that? So everybody said, including Einstein, but for 50 years after Einstein, everybody said, well, you can't measure this, of course. Okay, so give up. Einstein said gravitational waves are nice to think about, but they will have no implications because nobody can measure this. Okay, but there were a few crazy people. Uh, <laughs> and one of them, I had the fortune of eventually um, meeting and, and learning from and interacting and being mentored by, and that was really Ray Weiss at MIT, the, the key experimentalist, and also uh, a little later, Kip Thorne, who was the theorist. And I'm a theorist, but I was more mentored by Ray Weiss. Um, but Ray was obsessed with figuring out how will I detect gravitational waves. So eventually he made a proposal for how you're gonna do it. There were many other proposals in the community, but it's his proposal that became reality and worked. Well, it's his proposal that the prototype worked and then it became a real project because the prototype worked. Okay, so what was his proposal? How are you gonna measure these kind of small disturbances in space? Um, I have to tell you that Ray, when he was, even after he could demonstrate, half demonstrate in lab potential, he would go to colleague engineers, to colleague scientists, he would go to funders, and they would all laugh at him. So he was not always the highly respected scientist, Nobel Prize winner that he is today. He went through many decades of being made fun of. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what he uh, suggested is that basically you have to um, use the most precise measuring technique that we have uh, for relative changes of lengths to be able to measure. And uh, he thought that he could use laser interferometry. I won't explain to you what is laser interferometry, but I'll tell you how it actually, the principle is being used. So his thought of a telescope was the following. We're gonna put a laser source somewhere at the corner. We're gonna send the laser through a, a splitter. One laser is gonna 
go in one direction, the other is gonna go at 90 degrees in the other direction. They're gonna bounce off two mirrors that are hanging as isolated as they can from any disturbance, any other disturbance. The two lasers are gonna come back. We're gonna combine them here, look at the interference pattern, and then we're gonna figure out that this arm change length at the same time that this arm change length in a very particular way, in the way gravitational wave waves function. One arm got long, the other got short. One arm got long, so in that particular way. Okay, so this is the principle, and this is what got built at the end, except it is a lot more complicated, but this is the principle. So if there is no gravitational wave coming from above, these hanging mirrors are not affected. If there is a gravitational wave, then they move periodically in a very particular pattern, and that pattern is imprinted on the interference pattern and you can make this measurement. Okay, so eventually it took 40 years uh, of initially about 50, 100 people. Eventually we became a collaboration of a thousand people. I joined in the late nineties, construction started uh, 95, I think. Um, and for many years, uh, this is all the universities that now are mem members of the collaboration. And for many years, we were not, we were just measuring noise. And we were giving talks, telling the world that we will detect something one day. What we could show is that the sensitivity on the instrument be was becoming better and better and better. So there was hope. Okay, so this is LIGO, uh, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Way ob Observatory, and people would get angry. You cannot call yourself an observatory. You're not observing anything. <laughs> You're lying to the National Science Foundation. Thankfully, I wasn't high up and I didn't make the no, uh, name. So I would say, well, it's not my fault. Um, but, but that's the telescope, okay? That's how it looks. We have one in Louisiana, one at Hanford, Washington State. And um, and it went through many upgrades with patients. I'm not an experimentalist. I'm not an engineer. I have huge respect for my colleagues who made this thing uh, work and make this incredibly precise measurement in all of science and engineering, in all of the history of science and engineering. This measurement that led to the measurement of gravitational waves is the most precise measurement ever made by humans. All right, there's another detector in Europe. And how small is the stretch and squeeze that is now being measured? It's of the order of 10 to minus 18 meters. We all go, oh, I go still, what? Um, what does this mean, the really? I mean, beyond one divided by a thousand, do, you, do we have an understanding? Okay, maybe I should check time. Am I doing okay with time? Okay. Um, so let me give you a bit of a sense of what 10 to minus 19, 18 means. <clears throat> uh, take a meter, about three feet. It's about a meter. Okay. Take this length and divided by 10,000, so one over 10,000, you get the thickness of human hair, okay? Then divided by 100, you get the wavelength of optical light. And you divide that, divide that oops, I went back, sorry, why did it go to? Divide by another 10,000, the wavelength of light. You get, how big is an atom? then divide again by 100,000. You get how big is the nucleus of an atom. And then since you are used to dividing, divide by another 1,000, <laughs> that's 10 to the minus 18 meter. How is this possible we can measure this? Well, I won't spend more time explaining the measurement, but it was done. It is being done daily. 
It took enormous um, innovation in laser physics, material physics, vacuum systems, suspension systems, and all of these things are propagating into um, uh, numerous, dozens and dozens applications uh, in other spectrums, uh, seg segments of light. Okay, now my title says cosmic sounds. Please do not leave this lecture and say that Vicky Calogera told you that gravitational waves are sound waves, <laughs> not sound waves, okay? Uh, sound waves are, are um, um, the opposite of transverse, and now I'm missing my English word. Impressional or longitudinal. Longitudinal um, uh, waves. Gravitational waves are transverse waves. Propagation direction is perpendicular to the oscillation direction, okay? Um, so in practice, so in many ways, gravitational waves have nothing to do with sounds. And yet we often refer to them as the sounds of the universe. There is one silly or, or coincidental reason for that. And then there is one good reason for that. So coincidental reason. The, the gravitational wave detectors we have now, they're, they're sensitive to a particular range of frequencies, just like optical telescopes or RI is sensitive to only part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's always a certain range of frequency that every detector is sensitive to. That's what it means, a gamma ray detector, a certain range of frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum, et cetera. So, LIGO is sensitive to between, uh, let's say best case scenario, 10 Hertz to 500 Hertz. Now this is, if you take these frequencies in sound waves, this overlaps with the sounds that the human ear is sensitive to. Okay, so this is completely coincidental. It means nothing. Uh, okay, it has no physical significance, but we take the frequencies of our gravitational wave detections and we can translate them into sounds and play little sound bites. You're gonna hear a couple of them. But there is a physical uh, analogy to how the detectors work. Gravitational wave detectors operate like ears and electromagnetic telescopes operate like eyes on our body. What do I mean? Uh, our eyes point. Our eyes can only see things that our eyes look at. I cannot see what's behind my head. Ears are different types of detectors. My ear can hear things from all directions, better or worse, but all directions. This is what gravitational wave detectors do. Gravitational wave detectors, they're sitting on the ground but they can receive and detect the gravitational wave from all directions. An optical telescope, if it's pointing in that direction, the tube, it can only receive light from that side. It cannot receive light from the other or from the side, okay? So in that sense, gravitational wave um, astronomy, it's as if we're listening to the universe. Okay, uh, so that's more physical. At least it has some, Meaning, okay. Um, so uh, our first detail. Oh, I don't want my movie to play immediately. So let's not go there directly. So after all this story and after the work of many years, for me it was sixteen years, um, but for others like Ray, it was forty plus years. Um, we turned on, we had gone through a big upgrade of the detectors to make them more quiet so we can listen to, to um, uh, more, you know, what is the a sound if a sound is low, um, you know, quiet sounds. Um, we turned on our detectors first day and we get a signal. Now, everybody thought this is a joke. <laughs> There's not for, for 15 years, 20 years, we haven't seen anything 
Now we finally made another upgrade. We turn it on, we have a signal. Somebody put the signal in the data <laughs> to test our analysis. Because scientists do that. It's a, it's a, you know, you do blind testing of your, of your infrastructure, your instrument, your data analysis. So it took a while for people to not be mad at who in the leadership <laughs> gave the okay to inject the signal that's perfect on day one to drive us nuts. And they kept saying, we didn't do it, people. We didn't do it. This, is, this must be real. So the, the director of the observatory, Dave Wrightsy, a Northwestern alum, kept saying, I knew it. I knew it from second number one when I saw the image on the screen. Image, I'll show you what he means. Um, because I knew I didn't give an okay for injecting a signal. This was real. He was the only one who knew it was real. Anyhow, so what did we observe? Well, in sound, this is what we heard. Okay, it will stop. The first version is the straight translation from gravitational wave frequencies to sound. It's not in the perfect location of our ear sensitivity. Then we shift it a little bit, and then it becomes a little more clear. Now, it sounds like a chirp. Whoop, whoop. The definition of a chirp is that it's a sound that changes with time, it becomes louder as time progresses, and the pitch becomes higher. The frequency goes up. That's exactly what a gravitational wave is. Why? Two black holes, they start far apart. In fact, they start far apart for billions of years, potentially. But in our band, they're somewhere here. And then they spiral and spiral in and spiral in. Further apart, they're moving slower. As they come together, they lose energy due to the waves. They're approaching merger. The frequency of the motion is faster. The ice skater pulls her arms, her, his arms, they're going faster. Frequency goes up. That's one characteristic of the chirp. Now, two black holes are coming closer together. Guess what? Gravity is stronger. If the gravity is stronger, the curvature of the space is stronger. The amplitude of the oscillation is stronger. So the loudness of the signal is higher. That's what the chirp is. So if you plot the data we received, um, the frequency as a function of time, and then you use color brightness to show the amplitude, you get these banana shaped things mm -hmm. that as time progresses, they become brighter. And that's the image. We had automatic tools that would take the data and produce images like this. And that's what we saw on that first day. There's another way to plot it, which is the strain, which is the fractional change of how much our arms in the interferometer moved. We wish they moved that much, okay? <laughs> um, how much did they move fractionally? Delta X over X as a function of time. Now you see half and one on this scale, but it's multiplied by 10 to the minus 21. Okay, and it starts, and this is noise. It's blending in our noise, and then it emerges from the noise. And the amplitude goes up, and the frequency, the peaks come closer together. This is the scribble. Now, we don't look at this data and we say we made the discovery. Okay, there's very, uh, there's multiple completely different data analysis pipelines uh, with statistics, with analysis of the noise, with analysis of the errors, and they all gave the same result. Um, we also uh, could then decompose the signal, produce a, through general relativity, the expected signal, and that's the thin line. 
and GR was consistent with our data. Good. <laughs> I don't think we could have handled GR being wrong. Probably <laughs> our data would have been wrong, we would have said. So this is what's happening. This is a, a real numerical relativity simulation, real calculation of how distorted space-time is as the two black holes are coming closer and closer together. This came out of a collaboration between Kip Thorne's group at the time and another collaborator at Cornell, where I'm going next week to give lectures. And the two black holes are coming together. Here, the event horizons are blending. Now you have a single black hole. Throughout this movie, you saw the ripples. That's the gravitational waves in space-time. The oscillations are real calculations. This is not artist's impression. And they're moving away from the source. At the end, the waves stop being produced. So that's what we detected. And I'm almost done, actually. That first day, uh, we made the announcement six months later because we kept testing ourselves and analyzing and reanalyzing and asking questions and, and challenging and subgroup and red team and blue team and do this and do that in case it's a mistake. And eventually, ah, oh, I know what happened, of course. I don't know if we would have completely convinced ourselves that we didn't make a mistake. This was September 14. October 12th, we got a second signal. And it looked very similar. Not identical, different source, different masses. And then uh, December 26th that followed, we got a third signal different looking, but similar, obeying GR, general relativity, et cetera. We announced only the first one because we had done all the tests only for the first one. We didn't have enough time. But the fact that we were now seeing multiple sources in the universe from different parts of the sky gave us the confidence that we're doing a strong. All right, 2017. Um, August 17, maybe some astronomy junkies among you, you may remember that that's a few days before the total eclipse in the US. Everybody was driving towards a location for the total eclipse, everybody in astronomy at least. So I was on a trip with my family to show every, my whole group was all over the place in different locations. Um, we wake up one morning and we all check our emails and it turns out we have an amazing signal. By then we had a few more black, binary black holes. Uh, we had about 10 and there is a different kind of signal and it didn't take long. It, it took a half, you know, fraction of a second to look at the image and say, we detected neutron stars. Why? Um, this is all data translated into sound. How long did it last? The binary black hole lasted 0.2 seconds. This is 160 seconds. I cut it because who wants to wait 160 <laughs> seconds? Um, it was a long signal. Why? Neutron stars are much smaller than the black holes we were uh, observing. They're tiny, so they go around and around and around and around and they come and they're smaller, so they keep going and keep going and grinding and grinding. They take forever to merge, okay? So they went through the whole band. So when we saw the image, it went slow. This was the banana we saw. And the scale under the time, I'm only showing you 30 seconds here. So we knew no black hole can do that. These are neutron stars. So we went bananas because, uh, oh, and actually I didn't mean the pun, um, but <laughs> uh, because at the same time, our gamma ray colleagues detected an electromagnetic signal. Why are we excited? because this was the first multi-messenger detection with gravitational waves. 
Two black holes only produce gravitational waves. Neutron stars have matter. The neutrons are not behind an imaginary surface, okay? So when neutrons collide, they actually break up. You get protons uh, and electrons. You get charged particles to spill over and they create electromagnetic radiation. Not immediately, in, but after the gravitational wave signal stops. So the gravitational waves come from the spiral. You get the collision, gravitational waves stop. Then you get a whole cascade of electromagnetic emission, which was predicted and we were looking for it. It starts with high energies, gamma rays, which we got two seconds later. And then it goes through the whole electromagnetic spectrum and it keeps going for years. It's in the radio now. Long story short, we saw things in the radio, I'm sorry, in the gamma rays, in the X-rays, in the optical. And in the optical, that's when it made the news, we made the neutron star above the skyline, et cetera. Um, the optical material, the material that emits optical light is actually has, uh, it's nuclear uh, reactive, uh, nucle um, uh, a material that is nuclearly decaying. And it's where we get a uh, golden platinum formed in the universe. This is not where we get golden platinum, one of the places, but this is the only place we know for sure we get golden platinum. This is not something that you can form in the earth or in the interior of the earth. So that made the news, let's go and mine it, you know. <laughs> um, this is what happened. Now you have neutron stars, not black holes. This is an artist impression. NASA made this. It looks very fancy. <laughs> these, are, these are supposed to, no university can do this. No, they can, but we don't spend that kind of money. Um, uh, these are the waves. Uh, so these are the gravitational waves and the binary is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. We don't have the, the gravitational waves shown properly with ripples in the space. And eventually we'll have the collision and all hell breaks loose, to be honest. A lot of things happen and we observe them all because we can analyze the data and we understand electromagnetic emission really well. So you get the collision, you first get the gamma rays in a jet, and then you have a lot of material that comes later hours later and in this more isotropic material is where golden platinum gets produced the jet moves almost at the speed of light this material moves at tenth of the speed of light slow and that's the product of a neutron star merger these two discoveries were uh, claimed to be uh, two years in a row, number one science breakthroughs among all sciences for those two years. The fact that we were part of this, myself, my colleagues, my students, my postdocs, um, is a, it, it could never, we could never have uh, anticipated or or imagine that it would be that earth shattering. It could have not happened and happened for the next generation. We just feel extremely fortunate to have lived through this. Last slide. This is where we are now. All these blue weird vertical things are our binary black hole discoveries. We have 90, 90, black hole mergers detected. We now are doing astronomy. We measure masses, spins of black holes. We know how far away they are. We're trying to do cosmology with them. Um, we're trying to understand how are these things formed in nature. And the only way we're learning for, about them is through gravitational wave astronomy. I'm going to leave it here.
so much. That was fantastic. Um, we are running a little bit late on time, so we only have time for a few questions. I would love if any of the students who have questions, we could start there. Uh, so you talked about how if that circle that you projected that was squeezing and stretching, if it was on the board, a gravitational wave would have to come perpendicular to the board. Uh, why would it have to come perpendicular to the board? Yeah, so uh, that's not what I meant. What I, uh, and, uh, but th this is how exactly it sounded when I said it. Um, what I meant is that for the disturbance to be exactly as I was showing it to you and be all the whole disturbance to be embedded on the plane of the screen, the, the wave has to come perpendicular. But if it were coming at an angle, then the disturbance wouldn't all be embedded in this plane. It would be inclined as well. Okay, so uh, I was trying to say that what you're looking at makes sense if the wave is coming uh, perpendicular, but the wave could be coming at any direction. Um, and that's what we mean. It's like an ear. It can, waves can come from any direction and the LIGO will catch them. There is, of course, just like our ear, we hear better from certain directions and worse from other directions. LIGO is like that as well. So there is an antenna pattern. Uh, if a wave comes exactly at the plane of the detector, um, we, we cannot detect it. We have zero sensitivity. If it's exactly at the plane. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, would it be easier to detect these gravitational waves closer to the source of their- Absolutely, we wish. So very good question. Um, so the waves close to the source, just like a light bulb, right? Close to the source, electromagnetic waves are brighter and the further away we are, the dimmer they are. So gravitational waves, the same. If we were close to the black holes colliding, we would not, the, the strain, it wouldn't be 10 to the minus 21. It would be much higher. It would be of order unity. The, the movie I showed, that stretching of the, of the space-time is the calculation of GR. It's not just to make it visible. Um, here's the problem. Pairs of black holes are very rare in the universe. So, and pairs of black holes that are in the merger stage are even more rare. So, if you do this calculation, which was actually my job for the first few years I, jo I joined the collaboration, based on what we know about stars and galaxies, how often would we see a binary black hole? Well, it depends how far out can you see with your telescope. If our telescope was sensitive only to our own galaxy, we would have to wait a million years to see it, something. Instead, we have a detector that can see out to, in certain units, far away. But then the sources are far away. So to have a source really close by, you need the rate of these mergers to be high. So you have a high chance to have a source next to you. It's not a high rate. It's a very rare event in the universe. Thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Claudera. It was a fascinating uh, talk. I'm sure we have a lot of questions we want to ask her. Uh, we just don't have enough time right now for the questions, but we will have a reception afterwards. And if you have more questions, feel free to talk to our speaker. It was indeed a, a fabulous talk. I was very intrigued by it. I uh, myself have a question too, I will ask you later. Uh, so next is going to be a closing remarks by our provost of Nepal University, uh, Dr. Sama Ganem. Uh, Dr. Ganem was appointed a provost of Nepal in 2021 uh, after serving as an interim uh, provost since 2019 and uh, acting provost uh, since 2018. Prior to that, she was the Dean of uh, College of Communication. Uh, she's joining us by Zoom today. So we will uh, hear her uh, closing remarks here. Uh, I will turn over the virtual podium to Provost. Perfect, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kip. 
uh, I would like to add something about my introduction is that when I first started college, I was a physics major. Had I been able to attend a lecture like this, I think I would have continued being a physics major. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining us for the second annual William de Gutis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. We're very grateful to our alumna sponsor, Dr. Linda de Gutis, who so generously made this lecture series possible. I would also like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Calugario for serving as this year's keynote speaker. Your work as an astrophysicist is fascinating and a true inspiration for all women pursuing careers in science. Again, thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge with us all today. And I have to admit, I'm still stuck at the 10 to the minus 18, and I'm trying to get my uh, head wrapped around that. Uh, for nearly 125 years, DePaul has served a diverse community of learners. Here we embrace our differences. We support one another, and we're always looking for ways to do more. And that's why we created this lecture series to encourage and support our female students as they pursue careers in science and health related fields. It's certainly a very exciting time for the College of Science and Health. Earlier this fall, we introduced the new masters in speech language pathology and opened the speech language clinic on the Lincoln Park campus. Next fall, we will launch a bachelor's in nursing and a master's in occupational therapy. And in 2023, we plan to introduce new programs in engineering. All of these programs create new opportunities for our students that truly meet societal and workforce demands. Thank you all to the faculty and staff in the College of Science and Health for all that you do every single day for our students, from hands-on learning in the lab to lecture programs like this one. The mentorship you offer our students is truly invaluable. A special thank you as well to the faculty and staff who organized today's program. We do look forward to next year's Women in Science and Health Lecture, but I have to admit, I have truly, truly enjoyed today's lecture. And I'm just going to be thinking about everything that was uh, addressed today. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>